So our next talk is going to be on um, measuring the progression of PSC, uh, and this is a, kind of ties in with what we were talking about earlier in terms of treatments and uh, trying to determine how uh, you might do with your PSC. And this, giving this talk will be Dr. Goel, who was introduced earlier, so just want to welcome her back to the stage. No debates this time. So. Um, this is often the first question that we'll get when we um, tell a patient that they have PSC is, is what does that mean for them in the long run and um, do they need a transplant or what is their risk of having a cholangiocarcinoma and, um, and what the future holds for them, which is a really, really tough question to answer. But I'll tell you um, in as scientifically a way possible what we do, what we can try to predict or how we do um, you know, try to estimate what the, what the likelihood of, of transplant might be in the future um, based on some models that we've created in the past. So as you all know, PSC is a very uh, variable disease and it, it, the outcomes, the ultimate, um, the ultimate consequences that you can have from PSC take a very long time to de develop and it's a very chronic, chronic process. And the, the different way it presents is what is also challenging in terms of de determining what potential outcomes could be. Um, as, as some of you know, there's classic large and small duct PSC. Some patients, the one earlier in the room that asked, has just small duct PSC. Some patients don't have IBD associated with it, some do. Um, some have an overlap with autoimmune hepatitis and other ones might have an IgG4 cholangiopathy. So the variable presentations also make uh, the ultimate um, progression differ among these different subtypes. The median survival uh, from the time of diagnosis of PSC to transplantation varies depending on what studies you're looking at, but is in general between 17 to 21 years. And that just goes to show that it is a very slowly, slowly progressive disease. What are the outcomes that we're looking at when we say PSC progresses? And I like to think of it in three different things. One is you're looking at what is your chance of developing cirrhosis? And that happens from just the chronic cholestatic injury that you have. So when you, when you have that inflammation in your bile ducts, you eventually can develop cirrhosis from the scarring. Um, and then just because you have cirrhosis doesn't mean that you necessarily develop complications from the cirrhosis. So do you eventually develop decompensated cirrhosis, meaning signs that your pressures in your liver are quite high and that you develop ascites or you develop encephalopathy, the confusion that you can see when your ammonia levels are high, or varices, those, the, those veins, the dilated veins in your esophagus or in your stomach. So that is one possible manifestation of more uh, progressive liver disease from PSC. Another complication that you can have from PSC, especially when you have um, you know, stricture, se several strictures or dominant strictures, is recurrent cholangitis, and that's just recurrent infections. And as some of you know, that when you do develop ongoing infections um, with bacteria in your blood, that is an indication to think about getting listed for transplant sooner rather than later. And then the last big category of outcomes that we think about is malignancy. So cholangiocarcinomas, like we've talked about several times today, so cancers within the, the bile ducts of your liver, um, and then colon cancers, which are both increased in the setting of having PSC. So these are, these are the ways in which PSC can progress and what can we really predict about how, um, what, what it might look like for you in the future. So PSC is difficult to predict, um, and I'm sure that your doctors um, tell you that, and that's not a great answer to hair. Uh, over the last two decades or so, there have been several natural history models that have been developed um, to help predict prognosis. And for the most part, the prognosis that it's predicting is um, survival or the need for transplantation. The important thing to know is that these models are constantly being refined. So as we learn more about how the disease develops, as we learn more about um, different markers that might indicate more uh, faster degree of progression, that the, these are being refined over time. And that the, the tools that we use to also predict are being refined, and, uh, and there are several newer tools that, that we'll talk about in, in this presentation. So the first few models that I wanted to just bring up um, that were created, the first one was the Mayo model that was developed in 1989. And, and, and there were several iterations of that. There was a second revised Mayo model and the last one, which I think is the most frequently used now. But in between, um, you can see that the, the factors that are used to predict how your disease progresses is, is relatively the same in among these models. So age is a big one. This is age at the time of diagnosis, so the older you are, 
um, the, the likelihood of needing transplantation um, or, or survival differs. If you have higher levels of bilirubin, if you have higher liver enzymes, if you have higher levels of alkaline phosphatase, like we mentioned, that has been incorporated in several of these models to indicate that you have a li higher likelihood of needing transplant um, in the future. And the last, the last big one is a marker of um, the severity of cirrhosis, so the severity of your scarring in the liver, so portal hypertension. And these models incorporate that in different ways. So the, the Mayo model doesn't really have it in there. But in, in the King's College criteria that they have, you have splenomegaly or hepatomegaly, which are somewhat subjective findings and indicate that you have signs of elevated pressures um, from your liver disease. Again, splenomegaly and another one here. So, so there's, a, there's an age component. There's liver enzyme component, and then there's a component of how severe is your liver disease based on portal pressures or portal hypertension findings. The last big one is histologic stage, and you can see that most of these earlier models up until the, the newest Mayo model incorporated biopsy results. So you need a biopsy to tell you what the degree of scarring was, the degree of fibrosis was in your liver. The more advanced degree of fibrosis, the more advanced degree of scarring you had, the higher likelihood there was of progressing and needing a liver transplantation in the future. Um, the last, the, the newest iteration of the Mayo model in 2000 is, is, is definitely the most widely used model now. And instead of, it sort of eliminated the need for liver biopsies in terms of determining your, um, your, your, the severity of your liver disease or the fibrosis in, in your liver. And instead, what it used to estimate the amount of uh, portal hypertension, it was variceal hemorrhage. So if you had a history of variceal hemorrhage, then that likely, that, that indicated that you were more likely to need a liver transplant in the future. So the components of the Mayo model are age, bilirubin, albumin, your AST, one of the liver enzymes, and whether or not you've had a history of variceal hemorrhage. This definitely is the most commonly used model. These were the factors in their very large um, in their very large database that ended up being the most significantly associated with either uh, mortality or the need for liver transplant. The Mayo risk model uh, estimates survival up to four years, which as you know, in the course of having PSC is not that long. And this is the formula that you can you know, very easily do in your head, obviously, uh, putting in these numbers, and then you can kind of estimate your survival in four years. The good news is that there's a calculator online, and this is what you'll see us um, open up not infrequently in, in, in your room. So this online calculator you put in all of, all of the variables that we mentioned earlier, and that estimates the risk over four years. Um, based on the score that's ultimately calculated, you know, I should have maybe, maybe, uh, maybe done an example, but based on the score, it calculates what's called a computed Mayo risk score, and that varies between, you know, it can be negative numbers to over two, but the cutoff points that we look for are a risk score less than or equal to zero indicates that you're low risk. If your risk score is between zero and two, that categorizes you as having an intermediate risk. And then if your risk score is over two, it indicates that you're at high risk. And this has been validated in an independent cohort of patients as well. If you are low risk over time, and again, this is four years, your, your risk of needing a liver transplantation is quite low. If you're intermediate, it sort of depends um, on other factors. And if you're high risk, then your risk of needing a liver transplantation is quite high. So, so when, you, when we put these numbers in and we calculate something, what does this mean for you? I think it, it helps you and your doctor sort of determine um, where you're getting your care and if you need to be referred to a liver transplant center sooner rather than later. And if you are referred to a liver transplantation center, what, what the urgency is in terms of potentially um, getting listed and evaluated for that transplant. So patients that are low risk perhaps can be evaluated and followed by their, by their local community doctors just fine over the long period of time. And, and as the score is recalculated, you can potentially um, fall into different categories and, and the need and the timing of liver transplantation might change over the future. So I think this is a helpful tool that we all use and one that you should know about as well. And it does help um, overall estimate the, the prognosis of your, of your PSC. The biggest limitations, though, the Mayo risk score are that, like I was saying, it's only really validated to predict short-term out, short outcomes, so outcomes within four years, which, which is not a very long time at all when it comes to the, the overall um, lifespan of PSC.
And then, and then the other big thing is that it predicts survival or need for liver transplantation, but it doesn't necessarily predict other clinically important outcomes, such as cholangiocarcinoma or your risk of developing infections. Um, we don't have really good scores, honestly, or really good models for both of those, but, but the something to keep in mind is that, sure, it might determine your need for survival liver transplant, but other markers, maybe not so much. What are some other things that we can use to help predict overall prognosis? You've heard a lot about the serum alkaline phosphatase level today, um, and as much debate that there is about how useful of a biomarker it is, it is the biomarker that is the, the, what we're using as a surrogate reflection of the severity of your disease at this point. So while until other biomarkers are developed, the serum alkaline phosphatase we do think um, is, is helpful in helping determine prognosis over the long run. So over a course of many years, this is a study that looked at um, serum alkaline phosphatase levels over, over a span of greater than 10 to 15 year follow-up in these patients. In patients that had normal levels or less than 1.5 times upper limit of normal levels, really had a, a, a much higher survival probability without transplantation. In this actually, less than 1.5 in this study was no different than having normal levels which I think is interesting to know. And if you had continued elevation of your alkaline phosphatase levels over 1.5, then your need, the risk of needing a liver transplantation um, was higher in the, in the future. So it is a marker that, you know, in some patients does act, actually reflect the need for liver transplantation in the future and, and one that we use um, and measure frequently. Um, this, I wanted to just, you know, because I had mentioned it earlier, I wanted to make sure I made it very clear again today that uh, this is not necessarily effect of ursodiol and lowering al serum alkaline phosphatase, but, but purely that whether or not you have a lower alkaline phosphatase improving your outcome. So if you are not on ursodiol and you have a lower alkaline phosphatase or you're on placebo and have a lower alkaline phosphatase that does, that's, that does over the long period of time, we think lower the rate of your progression of, your, of PSC. Um, and the, the, the other graphs that I had shown earlier today that has been validated in several studies, and that is what we're using as our surrogate biomarker right now. So perhaps that has some pro, um, prognostic significance in PSC. This was an abstract that was presented at EASL that I thought was interesting and, and important to just look at. Um, from the UK PSC consortium of 1,700 patients, they looked at um, overall outcomes over, over uh, I think this was over five year follow up, potentially longer. And they determined that there was a serum alkaline phosphatase, which, I, which is if higher, is associated with an increased risk of liver transplantation. But more importantly, looked at two other fa factors that seemed to decrease the risk of liver, need for liver transplantation. One was small duct PSE, which seemed to have a more favorable prognosis in the future. And the other was if your PSC is limited to, to, your, um, to your intrahepatic duct. So if you have no extrahepatic, no involvement of your PSC outside of the bile ducts uh, of your liver, um, then you had a more favorable prognosis, which I think is interesting to note as well. There are other tools that are being evaluated to look at the um, prognostic significance in terms of predicting PSC or predicting survival without transplantation. One of these tools is the Enhanced Liver Fibrosis Panel. And some of you might have heard of this, it's called the ELF Panel. And it's a serum test that you can check with, a, with two different um, kits that are currently available. And it's a direct marker of fibrosis or scarring the liver that's based on three circulating levels. Um, you don't need to know these names, but hyaluronic acid, TIMP1 tissue inhibitor, inhibitor of metalloproteinase 1, and the propeptide of type 3 pearl collagen. And a, a panel of these is evaluated in, in the serum. And based on the level um, of, of your ELF score, of your ELF panel, you can be categorized into different tertiles. And there's no liver biopsy that's obviously required. This is sort of a surrogate for a liver biopsy in terms of determining the scarring in the liver. So similar to what we've seen before, if you have scarring in the liver, then your risk of needing a liver transplantation is higher in the future. If you don't have scarring in the liver, then the risk does go down. Um, and your likelihood of needing a transplantation does go down. So this is just another um, alternative way of determining fibrosis in the liver or determining scarring in the liver. Um, and and um, we'll talk about just some other ways as well. The fiber scan, I think many of you have heard of here. Fiber scan is, is a, it's a transient elastography. Is, is, fiber scan is what we call it, but it's transient elastography. It's a little probe that just goes 
um, right by your liver, kind of like you're getting an ultrasound, and it measures the liver stiffness. And um, it hasn't entirely been validated yet for PSC, but we do use it, and we can potentially use it in, um, in, in following liver stiffness and changes to liver stiffness over time. So this has been used in, more commonly in patients that have viral hepatitis, and we look to see if their scarring um, progresses. Um, and you can even use it for other types of autoimmune or conditions like PBC or, or autoimmune hepatitis even. But in PSC, because levels can fluctuate and liver stiffness can change based on concurrent infections in the liver like cholangitis, or if, your liver, if you have a new stricture, your stiffness can potentially change as well. But we, are, we, we do think that we'll be able to validate something in the future with the use of fiber scans. So there's been several studies that look at liver stiffness measurements, um, and again, as a marker of fibrosis and potential disease progression. So the cutoffs based on a, on a fairly large study of patients of liver stiffness measurements have, you know, your liver stiffness based on your fiber scan ranges from F0 to F4. They've, they've come up with different cutoffs, and, um, and we think that when you have levels that are very high, so greater than 18.5, which is quite, quite high, um, then your, your degree or your need for liver transplantation in the future does increase. Versus if you have lower levels of stiffness, less than 18.5, um, then, then your need for liver transplantation, your progression of disease is potentially slower. So it indicates a more favorable prognosis. In this study, I think more importantly was changes in liver stiffness over time, and that being a potential prognostic marker. So uh, the fiber skin is, is your, or your liver stiffness is dynamic. It will change as your disease progresses, and is this something that instead of doing repeat liver biopsies, we can potentially follow in the office, this is a test that you can do in the office, to determine whether or not your disease is progressing at a very accelerated rate or if it's kind of, you know, you're, you're moving along at a, at a fairly slower rate. And the study essentially showed that you, with changes to your liver stiffness over time, if you have a change of less than 1.3 kilopascals per year, um, that, that is a favorable sign, a favorable prognostic sign that you are, your disease is progressing slowly, that your need for liver transplantation might be lower. That's a little bit different for patients that had higher or more significant changes um, in their fiber scan results with liver stiffness measurements that increased to greater than 1.3 per kilopascals per year, that their likelihood of needing a liver transplantation in the future was higher. So I think this isn't something that I think all of us have incorporated in practice yet, because it's not entirely validated, but um, I think over time it will be interesting to see um, how this can be used to, to monitor your stiffness, and it's an interesting piece of information for you, yourselves to know um, in terms of how severe your liver disease is and how these changes are over time. The newest tool um, that I, I, I came across as I was putting this talk together is the PSC risk estimate tool. And um, this is actually in press right now. It hasn't, um, it's available, this paper's available online, but it hasn't been um, out in the paper yet, is, is a model that use, has used machine learning. Machine learning is, is uh, all the rage right now in liver transplantation as we try to gather a lot more data and not just rely on, on, on limited sample sizes, but rely on large, large databases and multiple iterations of databases to try to um, improve what we can predict. So this, this was a tool that was, that was created based on machine learning to estimate your risk of not necessarily transplant, not necessarily survival, but hepatic decompensation from PSC. So based on this machine learning algorithm, there were 19 potential models that were studied. And they utilized what in machine learning what we call decision trees, or 2,500 decision trees. And this was derived from 509 subjects, and it was validated again in about 278 patients. And what they ultimately determined, I'll show you the variables that they looked at, but the, uh, the, the statistical analyses eventually determined that this actually performs well, potentially better than the Mayo risk model, which we're currently using, and it, and it, it probably performs better than your MELD scores. Um, the, the really, really nice thing about this tool, as opposed to the Mayo risk score and other tools, is that it can be used over time, continuously over time, to reevaluate your risk of decompensation. So you can, you can measure your risk of decompensation at the time of your diagnosis by putting these values in, and then say a year later, two years later, your clinical situation has changed or your lab values have changed, or they haven't, they're potentially the same. You put in those numbers again, and you see what, what, what percentage changes have occurred over time. 
Um, not too surprisingly, the variables that were included in, in creating this risk estimate tool were quite similar to other variables that have been used in the past. So these, the, the, the graphs represent the, um, the relative weight of each of these variables in the tool. So the total bilirubin ended up being the most um, influential in the tool in terms of determining your risk of decompensation. Albumin was the next. Your serum alkaline phosphatase, the amount that it was above the upper limit of normal, your platelet count, your AST, age, how long you've had PSC for, your hemoglobin values, and your sodium. So these were all used in, in creating this risk estimate tool, and it really does incorporate almost all of the variables that you noted in the initial model that we had discussed. Um, and it also includes um, some of the MELD variable scores. So I think it has pooled together a lot of the variables that we use to sort of determine what, um, how severe your liver disease is and, 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 and really help um, predict the risk of hepatic decompensation. So I'm curious to see where this tool is used and how well it gets used in practice. None of us have been using this right now unless you all have and I didn't know about it. Um, but, but this is a newer tool that is available and I do think that eventually there will be a calculator online um, where we'll be able to, to put these numbers in and really calculate the risk of progression as well. So um, in summary, when we think about progression of PSC, I think it's important to think about exactly what you're measuring. You're measuring your, your, um, your risk of progressing into cirrhosis. You're me measuring your risk of developing decompensation of that cirrhosis, so ascites, varices, encephalopathy, which all have very important um, consequences to you. And then your risk of developing infections, and then lastly, malignancy. We have, we have some tools that can predict progression and the need for transplant, and I think that um, we sh none of them will be used in isolation, and we kind of all use these together. We'll calculate the Mayo risk score together. We'll look at the, layer of the, the serum alkaline phosphatase levels. The enhanced liver fibrosis school score is more used as a, as a research tool right now, but I do think in the future we'll, we'll, we'll start measuring this and incorporating fiber scans more. And then lastly, this, this PRESS2 calculator, um, I think it's interesting to see how that gets used over time and how well it gets validated in practice. Thank you. Thank you.